Welcome, no my hi my. Thank you very much for joining me this afternoon to learn uh, more about an assessment called Dibbles uh, to help us better serve our children in our literacy teaching. It's lovely to have you, and I was absolutely blown away by the interest in this um, and, and thrilled. So, thanks very much for uh, for giving up your afternoon. I uh, had a lot of really great questions submitted, so thank you very much for doing that, and. Uh, I'm going to jump in. So we are going to be learning about this assessment called Dibbles. Uh, and this is my session from Sharing Back at Christchurch. I presented this one and I'm giving myself a little bit more time this afternoon so that we've got plenty of time for questions and I can go into a little bit more depth about the information. So without further ado, we are going to be covering this afternoon. Uh, what is this assessment? What what is Dibbles used for? What does Dibbles stand for? Uh, where does it come from? And how might we use it in New Zealand? I'm going to show you how to administer most of the Dibbles subtests. And we're going to have a video example. And we're going to have a go at, uh, at scoring it ourselves. I'm going to look at the kind of information that we can get from the Dibbles assessment. Uh, some really, some kind of starting points. So important things for you to consider if you're going to have a try of this in your own setting. And then some, some first steps for you to, to have a try with um, back, in, back in where you are working. So feel free to pop questions into the chat. And my good friend Liz Kane is kindly offered to be my wingman and co-host and she's going to keep track of questions for me. So hi Liz, lovely to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you for joining us too. Right, DIBBLES stands for the Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. So it's an assessment that looks at foundation reading skills. Pronounce dibbles to rhyme with dribbles, um, which I found has resulted in lots of spelling mistakes, spelling it D-I-B-B-L-E-S, uh, and also not a great association, but uh, that will help you remember dibbles. And that's how the researchers at the University of Oregon pronounce it. Um, it's a set of procedures, a set of measures for assessing the acquisition of literacy skills. So the foundation skills that we need for children to be strong readers is specifically looking at um, at the skills that build reading they actually have a spelling screener which I haven't looked at yet but I'm really interested to see what's in that so it's been developed and researched by the University of Oregon um, for many years it's not a new assessment uh, new to our shores in Aotearoa but not new at all by any stretch uh, we're up to the eighth edition which was released uh, 2021, I believe. So the measures in Dibbles are very highly predictive and they're really well validated um, by the research and development on this assessment with lots and lots of children. So it's a very reliable... Maybe you should just do the built-in. Uh, and each subtest provides us with benchmarks so that it gives us... Um, data which is normed against age level peers and each of the subtests takes about one minute to complete. So what I would like you to do is grab from your uh, little packet there. We're going to jump in and we're going to watch a couple of videos of me doing this assessment with my son who kindly and unbelievably allowed me to to do the tests on him to show you. So I want you to take um, out of the materials I emailed you and asked you to print. So I'll get these ones and we're going to be looking at the first page on the inside, which says um, nonsense word fluency. So this is the teacher instruction page. Sorry about that going blurry. And I want you to look at this page, which has the scoring on it. And you can see what I recorded as I was doing this assessment with Millen. So we're just, I'm going to jump in and put the video on. And I want you to follow along and then we'll talk about how we score it. Dylan is in year three and I'm showing you the beginning of year or BOY benchmark. We're going to look at four subtests. Don't worry about those acronyms there, NWF, WRF. I'm going to explain those as we go. 
So here's the first one. This is called Nonsense Word Fluency. And this is how it goes. You ready? Mm. All right. So look at this word here. And if you watch me read it, hap, hap. I can say the sounds of the letters, hap. Or I could just read the whole word, hap. Okay, your turn to read this make believe word. So you just read this word the best you can. Mm, uh, mm. Lamb. Cool. And if you look at it and you can just say the word, that's fine. So you could just look at it and say, Lamb. That's it. You got it. Okay, so make sure, even if you can't read the word, you say any sounds that you do know. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Neat. So you can say the sounds, or if you see it, you can just say the whole word. Now, so here are some more make-believe or made-up nonsense words. Um, I want you to start here and go across the page and then to the next line and keep going. So when I say begin, I want you to read those words as best as you can. So you can point to each letter and tell me the sound or just read the whole word. Okay, put your finger on that first word. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, begin. Tad, neg, sat, gan, from, tag, rob, lan, nen, yan, nag, rab, rad, sim, ped, dad. Nern, rad, load, pad, talk, dog, da, hib, ven, rhyme, heim, low, and stop. Hey, well done. Some of those were such funny words, weren't they? <laughs> So that's the one minute nonsense word fluency test done. Uh, you'll see on your packet, uh, the page before has got the instructions for the teacher. So it says examine a script at the very top. So you say exactly what it says when you're delivering it. Look at this word. It's a make believe word. Watch me read the word, etc. cetera. So the, this is a standardized test. So everybody needs to deliver it in exactly the same way. So there is a script to follow for every for every subtest. Now let's have a look at Millen's scoring form here. Now before we score it, just pop in the chat, what do you already know after one minute about Millen's reading? What did you observe during that one minute nonsense word reading? Cool, some B and D reversals, yep, B, D. Good one. Okay, he knows long and short vowels, basic letter sound knowledge and can apply it to reading words he's not visually memorized. Awesome. Can segment and he can, yeah, he can blend to read CVC words. He's got a short vowel sorted. Yep, so there were no vowel errors in there. Um, and so when you say no short and long vowels, uh, the patterns that we saw in that he didn't get to any vowel teams. He had some R controlled vowels in there. Yes, he knows that silent E syllable. Thanks, Catherine. That's right. So already we can tell all of that. Oh, so Ingrid has said, do you note if the word was corrected, him or him? Yes. So if they read it incorrectly, but self-correct, uh, it's marked as correct. And I didn't get, oh, you know, he's, it's so quick that I didn't get a chance to kind of cross something out and then correct it. So I just ticked it. But yes, if they read it wrong and you've crossed it out, you then write S slash C, just like in a running record as we used to, and you don't count it as an error. Okay, so you've already learned all of that about his reading. I would also add, we could see that he didn't need to use overt sounding out. He's sort of not doing sound by sound decoding. He was able to look at that sequence of letters and pronounce it as a whole word. So he's sort of blending in his head before he reads out loud, which is another useful piece of information. Okay, so we've already gathered a huge amount 
from just that one minute. And then when we do the scoring, what we do is we look at on the column on the right here, we've got C CLS and WRC. Now, WRC stands for words read correctly. So it means the whole, um, if, if he's read the whole word as a, a out correctly and CLS is correct letter sound. So in this first row, there are 15 possible letter sounds to read correctly. And because he read all five words out loud, um, we would give him five for words read correctly. And we can count that there were 15 letter sounds correct in that line. And then in the next line, uh, how many whole words did he read correctly? Pop it in the chat. Awesome, four. Because in the second one, he did a, he mixed up B and P. Oh, that's another one we didn't notice. So B and P reversal sometimes. So we give him a four in this part here. And then if we were to count up the letter sounds correct, so you can take the total and just take away how many errors. So how many letter sounds correct on that line? 14, nice. Uh, and the same would be on the next line. We've got one, two, three, four words read correctly. And 15 letter sounds minus one would be 14. So if I was to put the scores up for us on this form here, it looks like this. And I should have actually, when I got to the end of one minute, I would usually put a finish bracket just to show myself that's where they got to on the, uh, after the one minute. Okay, so this is what it looks like. And I would like you to then, uh, on the front page of our packet, we've got the summary sheet. So on our sheet, the summary page here, you're going to go across to this first row. And here we've got NWF for nonsense word fluency. And you're going to, under correct letter sounds, the total that he got was 74. And WRC, words read correctly, is 24 in one minute. So that's that one done. And I'd say the nonsense word fluency subtest is probably one of the trickier ones just to get your head around the um, how to mark errors and how to um, how to count whole words read. It's not it's not hard. It's just there's lots of little different scenarios that you uh, will find children do. You know, they might say say the sounds correctly, uh, but then read the word wrong. They might say r uh, n rub, and then there's a different way to mark that or they might say the sounds incorrectly and then say the word correctly. So, but all of those scenarios are detailed in the manual. So we've got that on our front uh, marking sheet and I'll go to my next subtest. And the next one that Millen's going to do is WRF, which is word reading fluency. This one is real words. So if you flip to our next page in our assessment packet here, which would be page three or even page five, my apologies. <laughs> word reading fluency on page five. And this is real words. So they're high frequency words. They are a mixture of uh, regular decodable words and irre more irregular words. So for example, a regular word would be did, the first one, and then a less regular word might be many on the third line. Okay, so again, we go for one minute and we just mark correct or incorrect. And I find it helpful if you have time in the test to write down exactly what the student says as you're listening to them. So here we go. And you'll see my notations as you listen. All right, now we're going to read another list of words. So I want you to please read from this list of words. You're going to start here and go across the page. When I say begin, you're going to point to each word and read it the best you can. And if you get stuck, I will tell you the word so that you can keep reading. Can you put your finger on the first word? Mm -hmm. Ready? Begin. Dead going. Important over time and made her in years last, but place many him get thing here. He people to 
lucky fan with everyone a long travel show short Misha Misha Puck Puck It Pocket Pocket Speech Pack Keeping Well done <laughs> Right Gosh look how many words you got through there Heaps Okay, you'll notice as well on that page, you've got the teacher instructions at the top and on the right hand column, you can see prompts. So if a, if a child doesn't say a word, um, you know, they're not able to read it or they, they keep getting it wrong. After three seconds, you give them the word and you say, keep going so that they're not penalized for, for kind of getting stuck in one spot. Um, because these are timed measures, we there's a and there's this standardized way of delivering the instructions and the test every second matters and it gives us this reflection of how students are building in both their accuracy so how many correct but also their fluency which is their their speed or their automaticity so that's why you give the students a, a word and they keep going and each test have will have specific instructions about how you give that Right, so if we look at his um, score sheet there, uh, we've got the, it's just like on a running record, you'll see the, the total number of words on a line down the right hand side. So how many words did he get through in total if you pop that in the chat? Not counting errors. 32 words, awesome. And then how many errors? Remember, we don't count self-corrects, they're not an error. Cool, okay. So we have 32 words and two errors. So our total for that test there uh, is gonna be 30 words in total. Good one. Okay, so on our sheet, we're going to turn to our front page again. So the summary sheet, and you'll see in the next column along, WRF, that's word reading fluency, and we're going to pop 30 in that column there. Right, let me just address some of those questions there. So what time did he have for that word test? He had one minute. Almost all of the subtests are one minute. Okay. The mix of words is really interesting. They're all taken from the, I forget how many, but it might be 1,000 most frequent words or the 300 most frequent words. Uh, Susan uses a tracking strip for a couple of students who find tracking difficult. Now that's completely acceptable. So in the teacher manual, it specifies exactly what accommodations we can use and using a plain piece of card to go line by line is fine for students that need it. It doesn't invalidate the test results. Uh, yep, there's some easier words quite a way through. Now, I should point out, I am new to dibbles as well. I'm just uh, maybe one or two steps ahead of you all. I'm learning uh, very much this year. So I just um, don't know it inside out. So I'm definitely still looking at lots of answers in the manual. And I will do my best to answer questions. Here we go for the next bit. Our next subtest is... ORF, which stands for Oral Reading Fluency. So this is a one minute timed read of a passage of text. Uh, and you mark it in a similar way to what you would have for a running record. So um, crossing out words they skip, writing down words they substitute. Um, you know, if they put words in the wrong order, you're gonna note that. And also if they self-correct. Again, this is all step-by-step -step in the manual. Um, so you can see all of the instructions uh, for that. Let's listen to Millen with his passage read and you'll see on the next page after the word reading one, it's called Church Pairs. It says page six at the bottom. So here we go, here's Millen reading Church Pairs. Right, so this one's a reading, a little bit of a reading of some text. 
So, let me get my timer ready. Right, so I would like you to read this out loud. If you get stuck, like last time, I'll tell you the word so that you can keep reading. When you say stop, I might ask you to tell me about what you read, so I want you to do your best reading. Mm. Okay? All right, so you're going to start here. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Put your finger under the first word. Okay, begin. The church on our street, it has a big parking lot on a patch of grass at one end is a pear tree. The church lot and the it tree is a, a, a play playground. Mon most day there is three are us on good one thank you and um, what was the place that you read about in that story a church yeah a church can you remember what kind of tree was in the parking lot the pear, a pear tree. Yeah, that's an American word, parking lot. In New Zealand we say the car park, but in America they say parking lot. Yeah. All right, great job. We are up to our last activity for this morning. Okay, before we go into looking at that one, I've got a few questions there and also a few comments about that one. Okay, so the Americanism in that text is now fixed because... Uh, since I did that on Millen in March, Dibbles from the University of Oregon worked with a group of teachers in Australia, and they've now released Australasian versions of all of the benchmark materials. So any American spelling, so for example, mom, M-O-M has been changed to M-U-M, and particular vocab words like parking lot have been changed to car park. And uh, a dollar bill has been changed to a dollar note. So they've, they've, they've fixed that. So now we don't have that. There's still, I think, one passage, which is about a, um, a snow day, which most of our children, especially in Australia <laughs> and in New Zealand, won't have um, experienced. So they've changed some of that. Uh, now, questions here. So is the text unseen? Yes, it's unseen for every child that completes it. It's a standardised test. So every child that completes it, it it's, they're in the same boat. It's a text they've not seen before. So we can compare um, how they approach a text that they've not read before. Um, is the New Zealand Year 3, is that my notation? Yes. So that's one of the things I'm going to talk about later. On the pages here, I have watermarked all of the materials to help make sure I don't pick up the wrong one. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, any other questions here? Do all year three students read church pairs? Yes, and even if we know they're struggling readers, yes. Uh, so what happens is, for benchmarks, uh, we have we always use their year level and that time of year test forms. There are discontinued rules. So if you've got a child that um, cannot read any word on the first line and in all of the tests in the first row, you stop the test. Um, you don't do that subtest. So you're not, because they're brief and because they have those discontinued rules, that's the way we reduce that um, experience of uh, really intense frustration or unhappiness. We don't want children feeling like they're really failing. So there are those discontinued rules. Um, and we need to use the same forms for all of our children so that we can see on grade level on, on you know the expected level for their year how they are doing um, within for themselves and also compared to their peers and it really helps us guide our teaching earlier question are there different levels of the reading passages not for benchmarks so within a year 
all the testing forms remain the same level of difficulty for the whole year. So what they get at that beginning of year test is the same difficulty as what they will have at the end of the year. What changes is how much of it or how many per minute or their score per minute that we expect them to get to be on target to reach our goal for the end of the year. Okay, would I recommend that for intervention students? Yes, and I'll talk more specifically about that later. Okay, I'm going to come back to Millen's page there and we'll have a look at the marking. So we've got um, total words read, so just like a running record, we can count on from 31 here. So 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. So total words read is 36 minus the errors, 36. And then the number of errors is, uh, he, we don't count adding a word because it's already kind of penalizing him because it makes him take longer. So we don't need to add an error there. And that's all in the instructions. Uh, he corrected, self-corrected R back into R again. Uh, he missed days. So one, two, three errors is what his total is. So the total words correct is going to be 36 minus three, which is 33. So if we pop that into our front page, and our summary here, we've now got all reading fluency, we're going to have words correct as 33 and errors as three. Now we're going to look at the final subtest for his year three section. They do a different collection of subtests depending on what year they're in. Okay, the final one is called the maze. So this one is looking at, it's a basic comprehension screening check. At this one, so all of the subtests are one minute, except for the maze, which goes for three minutes. All of the other subtests are done one to one, so teacher and student, but the maze can be given to the whole class. You print out the sheets for them and they read it silently to themselves and they circle uh, the answers they want and then the teacher collects them and marks them afterwards. So I'll show you the beginning of this maze. We're not going to obviously watch them in silence for three minutes, but uh, I'll show you how it starts off. All right, you're going to read a passage with some words missing from it. For each missing word, you're going to see a box with three words in it. And your job is to circle the word that you think makes the most sense in this passage. So let's look at the practice passage together, which is this part here. And you're going to listen as I read. Can you um, follow with your eyes from here? Mm -hmm. Tom goes to school far from his house. Every morning, he takes a school art bus work to go to school. So we'll stop there. Let's circle the word bus. You can do that because I think bus makes the most sense here. Let's listen to how that sentence sounds now. Every morning, he takes a school bus to go to school. Yeah, that, that was a good choice, eh? All right, so now it's your turn. I want you to read the next sentence silently to yourself. And when you come to a box, read all the words in the box and circle the word that makes the most sense to you. When you're done, pop your pencil down. So you're going to read this sentence here to yourself and you're going to choose the word you think makes the most sense. Happy with that? Okay, great. So let's just have a look at that. So, in the afternoon, library, or morning, he also takes the bus home. So you should have circled afternoon, because afternoon makes the most sense. Listen, in the afternoon, he also takes a bus home. Yes! Alright, when I say begin, I want you to turn the page and start reading the passage silently, so inside your head. Start on the page with the title. When you come to a box, read all the words in the box and circle the word that makes the most sense in the passage. Okay, you're going to stop when you come to a stop sign, like this, 
or when I say stop. So it's going to be for three minutes, all right? And don't worry if you don't get to the end. It's made so that it's really long and most people will still be working when we say three minutes, okay? Yeah. All right, you ready to go? Mm. Okay, so. So you're gonna turn the page after I say begin. Okay, ready? Begin. Mm. So you're gonna read it silently to yourself. So that goes for the three minutes. And what we got after three minutes was this. And so when you look at the teacher key, you have the answer sheet, which just has the answer in bold. So it makes it quite easy to score. You just, um, excuse me, you just look over to their one and you can tick off what they got. So how about you mark his words right there? Let's give you a minute. And when you're done, pop in the chat how many words correct he got in that three minutes. Nice. Okay, cool. So five words correct and one incorrect. So we actually need, we need to record that because they lose a half a point for each incorrect response. So his adjusted score is 4.5. So pop onto our front page here. And on the last part of the sheet, we're going to put maze. He got five correct and one incorrect. Now that passage, the introduction passage on the front about Tom catching the bus in the afternoon remains consistent all the way through from when they start doing the maze right through to year, uh, to year nine. It never changes. So once they get the hang of that, you're, it will be very familiar for them, that introductory um, piece. And you could have, because it's a PDF, you could have that, um, when you're introducing it to your class, you could have that large on your class screen and you could be showing them on there how it works. <clears throat> so I've had teachers tell me when they've tried this out, the first time they try the maze, I mean, it's a three minute test, but it's taken them about 20 minutes by the time they've handed out the forms, explained how it works to the kids, got them all set up. You want them to be spread out around the room and, and with a maybe a little barrier, like a folder, so they're not looking at each other's work. And so they can work silently for, for the three minutes. So first time through, it's it takes a little more than the three minutes, but you for all of these, you're going to get for in, like any assessment we do, you get faster and faster at running it. Okay. So now what we're going to look at, um, I just want to introduce you to how the how the scores get treated in Dibbles and how the information is kind of color coded or, or to give us some more information. All right. So what I really like about the color legend is it's not you, you might see the words, you know, um, at benchmark or below or well below, but that's really not the focus of it. It's very much about identifying children's risk of not meeting the end of year benchmark goal. So is this child on track to be where they should be at the end of year three? Um, and the second part that's the focus is what does that mean for our teaching? So for example, the blue color is the very high part. It's our aspirational goal for children. If they score blue, they are at pretty much no risk of not meeting the end of year benchmark. What does that mean for our teaching? They need our really good quality classroom teaching, plus they probably need extension and enrichment. If their score for a subtest or the composite score comes out green, um, they're at minimal risk of not meeting that end of year benchmark. So they are on track. This is again the minimum we would like them to be at to be comfortably meeting that at the end of the year these children's needs will be met by our good quality core classroom teaching, um, you know, addressing all of those strands of the reading rope. Now, if a child comes out as yellow, they are at some risk of not meeting the end of year benchmark for their year. What does that mean for our teaching? They're gonna need that core classroom teaching, so our tier one teaching for all, plus 
tier two teaching or strategic support. So, so a double dose or some reteaching or some more opportunities to practice what we're teaching them um, in order for them to get into that green zone and meet their goal for progress by the end of the year. If they come out at red, they are at risk. Uh, they are likely to need a good quality core tier one classroom teaching plus some intensive support, providing extra opportunities to practice, uh, um, be retaught concepts, um, and we can increase the how intensive that is by reducing the size of uh, the group that they're working in. So that would be called tier three teaching as well. So what we've got then is, now you will all have access to a free spreadsheet, which I'm gonna show you how it works right now, uh, which is a fairly complicated spreadsheet. Um, it was shared by a teacher in Australia on the Divils in Oz Facebook group. And I took that spreadsheet and spent a couple of days uh, adding year seven and eight information in, making the color coding work on Google Forms as well, and adding it, uh, changing it all to New Zealand years and adding in a few other features. So I would like to show you those and how they work. Um, so you can use this spreadsheet if you want to try Dibbles. We're gonna put Millen's scores into that just now. So I've opened up the spreadsheet and I'm on the year three tab don't see the color tabs at the bottom. We've got all of these different tabs here. Here's year three. And this was the beginning of the year benchmark that you've just been watching. So we did that at, um, at the start of this year. I was a little bit late. I think it was March that we actually did that. This line here, the green benchmark minimum shows you what number in that subtest or in the composite does that child need to score to be in that green zone? And I found that a really helpful uh, number to have there visible for me when I'm entering information. So if we enter Millen here, so we've got not the first columns here are the nonsense word fluency that we read. So correct letter sounds, we had 74. So that's in the green zone and his target for the beginning of year three is 50. So that's great, we're comfortably in there. And words read correctly as whole words is 24. So that's going green as well. The target for green is 15. And we also gained all of that information about his knowledge of letter sounds, his ability, that, that BD reversal, his ability to blend to read unfamiliar words. Uh, WRF is the word reading fluency. That's those real words that words read in one minute and he read 30 words. So again, that goes green. That's comfortably in that green target zone of at least 26 words per minute. ORF is oral reading fluency. This is the one minute passage read that we watched him do. And we've got here that he read 33 words correct in one minute and he made three errors. And you'll see when I see the accuracy here has gone blue, it's calculating it as 100%. If I put three into the errors here, which I'll just zoom in a bit for us. Yeah, that might be better. If I put in the three errors, now I see that that was 92% correct. And his target for the beginning of year three is 92%. So we're just in the accuracy target, but let's look at this rate per minute. So words read correctly per minute is 33. And by the beginning of year three, we wanna be seeing at least 49 words correct per minute. So you noticed it was very slow and effortful. Um, he lost track of what he was reading as we listened to him. And we can see that we're at risk here of not being on track to meet the target for the end of year three. Let's look in here about the maze score. So five correct and one error. So that gave, it'll automatically calculate that that's now 4.5. And if we look at the target, he really wants to be getting at least five total for the maze for the beginning of year three. So we're not too far off um, in that maze subtest. And remember that's looking at comprehension. And then this calculates a composite score. The composite score is really a very, like it's a full page worth of um, instructions on how to calculate. It's a really complex formula. It's got weighted, the scores are weighted and um, all sorts of things going in that formula. In fact, you can see the formula up here. It's, it's a pretty complicated one. But you, you don't want to be looking just at the composite score to see how kids are going, because we can see here there's a big gap in the middle. But the composite 
um, the researchers at the University of Oregon and the webinars I've watched have shared that that's the most sensitive identifier of risk. So we still, um, we take that into account when we're looking at all of the information. <laughs> all right, good, you like it, that's great. That's good, it is amazing. I, I can't take credit for creating it. It was really well done when I got my hands on it and it's um, really grateful to uh, Gillian Lee, who was the, so when you get it, there's this, on the first page, there is this, um, box telling you who it was from, you can, you're welcome to delete that box, but it also tells you this password here, it says dibbles and uppercase, um, because all of the tabs are locked to prevent breaking the formulas. So if you want to unlock it, that's fine and, and edit it, you can, the password's included in the file for you. Yep, the spreadsheet is shared freely uh, on the website. Cool, let's go back to looking at this in a bit more depth. So as I said, when we look at the data, um, this, is, this is not Millen's data, this is from a real school, uh, a year two class. And this, when you're in year two, you also get two extra subtests. So there's letter naming fluency, which is just naming, it, it's a page of single alphabet letters and they say F, G, D, M sort of thing. And there's also phonemic awareness, um, phoneme segmentation fluency. So you say a word like mop, and the child says, mm, oh, and you see how many sounds they can segment in one minute. And the other ones, how many letters can they name in one minute? So if we were to just look at their composite score, we see here we've got red, green, red, red, and yellow. Uh, we really need to make sure that we're looking in depth at all of the components because of the way that it might not highlight specific learning needs. So if I get rid of just the oral reading fluency. So year two, middle of the year. Let's say we've got this green child here. Wow, their reading fluency was way up in the blue, but look at their accuracy. They're missing a third of the words and they're incorrect. So that tells me they're fudging and guessing a whole lot of the words and I need to really work on that careful, accurate word reading. Uh, I can see here again, although this uh, student three uh, these are all made up names, by the way, on the, on the left. Uh, reading speed is okay, the reading fluency in green 26, but we have um, 20, uh, we have only 76% uh, correct. Uh, this child that came up yellow is reading okay, and this one, and this red child is reading seven words correctly per minute and four words correctly per minute. And then again, if we go dig even deeper down into those earlier foundation skills, we see lots and lots of gaps where we really need to do some big amounts of work. So don't ever just go on the composite score as the, the moral there. Now, Dibbles is not uh, all the assessment that we need at, by any stretch. It is a universal screener. So we absolutely still need in-depth assessment. So we think of Dibbles as being uh, taking the temperature of everybody in the class. Uh, we know what the normal range of temperature is. And so when we get a, a, a fever or if somebody's hypothermic, it doesn't tell us why. We need to do some further assessment. So we might need to order some blood tests or a throat swab or something to figure out what is the problem. And the same, and then we know how to treat it. So our, we use our classroom diagnostic assessment. So you'll hear We've got screening assessment, diagnostic assessment. There's also formative and summative assessments, which are topics for another day. Dibbles is a screening assessment and you'll still want diagnostic assessment. This is classroom diagnostic. So not um, diagnostic as in diagnosing dyslexia or any sort of other learning difficulties, but identifying specific learning needs and teaching needs. So for example, if they get low phoneme segmentation. We are gonna use a phonemic awareness assessment uh, that gives us a lot more information about their ability to uh, segment CVC words and CVCC words and blend CVC and CVCC words uh, and do phoneme manipulation like delete phonemes, say blue, say it again but don't say it all, you get boo. Uh, so we'll do that and then we're going to teach the skills that we've identified that they don't have. Uh, same sort of process if they are low on that nonsense word reading 
we are going to use a phonics assessment that's aligned with our scope and sequence for teaching through structured literacy. So if you're using little learners books, you're going to use the LARS assessment, the little learners assessment of reading skills. If you're using the sunshines, you're going to use theirs. If, you're, if you've got older students, you might use the phonic books diagnostic assessment or um, a generic one if you don't have a specific scope and sequence. It's going to tell you um, what, uh, what gaps they have and what you need to teach them. Okay, we've got a quiz about these subtests. So let's see how well we learned about what the different subtests can, uh, can show us, what information they'll give us. Okay, so first I'm just gonna give you just a minute to read those labels down the bottom because you're gonna need to use them for your answers. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna give you a label in the yellow section and in the chat, you are gonna put what, um, what you think the answer is. So here we go. First one is, which subtest gives us information about children's alphabet knowledge and their rapid automatized naming out of the bottom? So put the number. Well done, yep. Number six, letter naming fluency. So this one is a really sensitive indicator of risk. It kind of, it shows us two things. It shows us what the, because you do it right from year one when they start, it's for year one and two, um, or just year one maybe. It kind of gives us an idea of what literacy um, exposure they've had before they come to school. And as they progress through the year and they are learning uh, letter names later in that year one, uh, it gives us a measure of uh, rapid automatized naming, which tells us about working memory. I have some recommendations for another um, assessment there, the CHIPS screener, check how I process, I'm just going to add that in. CHIPS screener is from Australia and it's free from READ3 uh, for uh, RAM. A really nice little free screener. Okay, the next one I want you to match up is which subtest tells us about phonemic awareness? What number? Thanks, Alison. Number five. Awesome. Phoneme segmentation fluency. Good job. Cool. Which subtest tells us about letter sound knowledge, so phonics knowledge and decoding skills? Ooh, I'm getting a mixture of sevens and ones. Okay, so we're going to go for number seven, non-word fluency. That really gives us a pure measure of their growing alphabetic code knowledge and their ability to apply that to read words they haven't seen. Which subtest tells us about their fluency reading high frequency words, real words? Yep, nice number one. Which subtest tells us about fluency and accuracy reading connected text? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, number two. Good stuff. Which subtest tells us about basic comprehension? Number four, that's the maze where they circle. So every seventh word in the maze is a choice of three. And they need to be understanding as they go to select the right one. They need to have pretty decent vocabulary and background knowledge. Okay, and finally, uh, the one that gives us the overall reading skill and risk indicator is that composite score. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, a question there. I'll just pause for a moment. Thank you, Liz has passed on a question. So this one was, um, here we go, questions. How does this fit within a scope and sequence assessment? Right, so this sits alongside and you still want your scope and sequence assessment. So as I mentioned, if you were using, for example, little learners, you would use the Lars assessment or Sunshine's or um, whatever aligns with the order of your teaching to show what, in, particularly in year one and two and in some of year three, to show what knowledge they've got. The Dibbles is going to be picking up 
early all of our children who are at risk. So it's a very sensitive measure. It will give you very few false negatives. I'm always going to get this one mixed up. It's basically, it might slightly over-identify kids who are, are at risk, but you won't miss anybody is basically what it does. So you're not going to miss anybody who is not making the kind of progress that we want for them to get um, to fluent and accurate and reading with comprehension by the end of that year. And so I would say do it alongside. It's a very quick battery of tests. And we, we want to make sure we're not missing that age five to seven year old window where our extra support is gonna make the very most difference for our children who are at risk. If we get in there at that stage and we put in place the extra teaching to keep them up, we can prevent most reading difficulties. We can significantly reduce the impact of dyslexia on their reading outcomes. If we don't find that out until children get to year three and four, we are completely on the back foot and the intervention is gonna take four times as many hours and a lot more unhappiness and frustration to get children to catch up. It's much, much harder to do. So this is a tool. Um, some of the subtests are validated screeners for identifying risk of dyslexia. I want to be clear, they're not there, they don't diagnose or identify dyslexia, but they give us very reliable red flags for us to then take the right action and get kids referred to the right places and for us to change our teaching. Okay. Lots of questions coming in, that's good. I'm gonna come back to, let me just check these questions here. Uh, is year seven and eight only reading fluency in Mays? I'll show you that in a moment. What year do we start Dibbles? Dibbles can be used from uh, the start of school right through to year nine. Okay, and can classroom diagnostics look fine, but Dibbles shows areas of risk? I would say unlikely if you're using um, evidence-based classroom diagnostics. So I would say you could absolutely have a leveled reader running record look okay and have dibbles show up actual areas of need. But I would say not a look at phoneme graphing knowledge and word reading and decodable passage reading wouldn't show up. Um, you would have seen that in that assessment. Okay. All right, so looking at Millen's data, um, here we go. Here's his spreadsheet. Out of these choices of four, one, two, three, or four in the chat, what teaching does he need most now, do you think? What should we do for him right now? Do we need to build his phonological awareness? Do we need to teach him more phonics and decoding skills? Do we need to give him more text reading practice? Or do we need to give him comprehension strategies practice? Nice, okay. All right, I agree with three definitely. And this is partly knowing knowing him. <laughs> uh, so Melon has got fantastic uh, language and background knowledge. Uh, he can discuss all sorts of scientific principles and when we, we're reading him novels that are, you know, you'd normally read to year five and six kids and he really he follows along he gets it he listens to wings of fire on audiobook which take 12 hours to, un to listen to and he follows along and understands so i know that comprehension isn't actually a problem for him uh, if, he, if only he could read the text so i can see that that or that reading rate is really low uh, he absolutely needs a whole lot more practice reading text to build his fluency uh, and we want to keep a very close eye on that accuracy. But I suspect, given his nonsense word reading being quite high and his word reading being fine too, that really it's just practice reading text that is what he needs. And lots of it. <laughs> Wide reading and lots of time reading. So given that, why might his basic comprehension score in the maze have been low? Pop in the chat, what do you think? Yeah. Okay. So lots of good points there. Spending so much effort in the actual story reading uh, that he lost the story outline. Yep. 
he didn't read many words. Okay, so he's working so hard at lifting those words off the page fluently that his comprehension suffered. Absolutely. So two things there. One is working memory. So, so much of his limited working memory went into lifting words accurately off the page that there wasn't much left to understand as he read. And you certainly could see he lost track of whatever was meant in the church peers passage. And then in the maze then, his reading was so slow as to mean he didn't get through many of the boxes. So I really can't use that as a measure for me as a teacher of how well he can comprehend text because he actually just didn't read enough of it in the three minutes given to him. So there's two things going on there that we really need to uh, keep in mind. So we've got there that those words correct per minute reflects speed and automaticity of reading. And there are really well established norms of how that develops right up into secondary school. And the Hasbrook and Tyndall norms, uh, which I don't have a reference for on here, are based on over 6 million children about what, how many words correct per minute we can expect children to, um, to achieve um, three times a year right up until the end of year nine. I just want to pop in here this quote <clears throat> from uh, Jane Hasbrook and Jerry Tyndall. Words correct per minute has been shown in both theoretical and empirical research to serve as an accurate and powerful indicator of overall reading competence, especially in its strong correlation with comprehension. So what that's saying is if children can read accurately and at a fast rate, and it's roughly, off, I've often read that it's at least 90 words per minute to be able to understand as we read, but if they're getting there, so up around, you know, up and nicely over the 100 words per minute and heading up towards 150 when they're older, um, we can be fairly confident that their comprehension is pretty good, especially if they're reading with expression. You can't put in the right um, phrasing and expression if you're not understanding as you read. I think that's a really key piece of learning for all of us to really keep in mind. Um, and with that information, um, combining that with other more recent learning that's um, kind of making its way into the teaching field, that comprehension skills are not transferable between one piece of text and another. Um, I feel like this demands that we consider the implications for the reading comprehension assessments that we use. This could be another whole day's workshop um, because comprehension of text is so complex, but we need to know it's just highly reliant on students' familiarity with the, with, and background knowledge of that topic. Um, and knowing that we can't teach inferencing skills in a way, for, just as an example of comprehension skills, we can't teach those skills in a way that will transfer out of one specific piece of text and into another. And so the question there is, um, why would we use very time intensive assessments of comprehension skills when we can't translate that data into our next teaching steps? Uh, but I have to pack that because that's a question for another whole day. Okay. Pop your questions in there and, and I'll, I won't answer them today, but I will definitely keep them and maybe I'll, we'll, we'll look at that for another day of learning. All right, so no child will ever get every single Dibble subtest. Um, it changes across the years. So the most they will ever get is in year two, when they'll have four or five of the six total subtests. So let's have a look just quickly. In year one, they get that uh, letter naming fl fluency, phoneme segmentation, nonsense word reading, real word reading. And so your total for year one benchmarks, which are three times a year, is about five to seven minutes per student. In year two, you add in uh, the reading fluency passage. So they're not expected to be able to read a connected text passage with uh, any kind of speed at the end of year one, but in year two that is introduced. So in year two, we're looking at about six to eight minutes per student to do the uh, benchmarks three times a year. Okay, in year three to four, uh, we have these four subtests. We have nonsense word reading, word reading, the reading fluency passage and the maze. And that takes about six to eight minutes per student, three times a year. And then finally, for year five to eight, we only have the oral reading fluency passage and the maze. 
Now, what you're going to do is whenever you get children who are yellow and red, you're going to dig in and do, it, do more further assessment. So we need to figure out if they're not reading fluently, we're going to have to dig out a phonics assessment, phonemic awareness, and look at their word reading skills to see what's going on in there. And we might need to dig deeper with oral language as well uh, to see if that's impacting on their ability to learn to, to read words and also their reading comprehension. Uh, this is from the Dibbles uh, information on their website. This is kind of a one pager of how those subtests, uh, which ones you give in each year. So here we've got, I've, I've put the New Zealand years on. So year one, you'll see one, two, three, four subtests. And you can see year two adds that, uh, that extra one in. And then from here on, year five onwards, we only have those two subtests. I've got a question about progress monitoring. I certainly am going to talk about progress monitoring in just a moment. Right. So if you're going to have a try with Dibbles, here are think some things to consider. So number one, uh, the materials. This is where I think a lot of people have had a look at Dibbles. They've downloaded the files and they've suddenly hit a brick wall and thought, oh my goodness, I, there are so many documents, so many pages, not going there. So my, my advice is... Um, to, to get your materials printed and organize them into a nice folder, you are going to have, you're going to print out a packet of, so what, the, what you've got in your hand is a student packet, and you would print out the materials for this, you might just want to try it once, so you're just going to print out that time of year benchmark, we're coming up to the middle of the year benchmark now, so that's what you would try. Uh, but if you were going to be doing it all year long, I would print out for each child, their full year's worth of um, teacher record form. So they're going to have the three benchmarks. So it'll be three times what you're holding in your hand if you had a year three class. And put that, label it with the child's name with their um, summary sheet in the front, put them into a folder. I'll just stop that for a second. You're going to have these packets, put them into a folder. So you've got your class worth of children with all of their forms ready to go for the year. And then you're going to have the student pages uh, which are in larger font for the children to see. So it's not the same. You have just a record form and they have a larger version, um, which looks like, here's an example of the, the student page. So you only need one of those and you're going to put that into a, maybe you print that on card or on a colored paper so that you always know what's the student page and you can have that ready to go for the kids. Uh, and just do that. <laughs> so I would also recommend um, labeling the files. I'll show you how I've done it in a moment. So just get past that initial printing uh, barrier and, and get your materials organized before you start with the children. The next consideration is that Dibbles is a standardized assessment. So that means we everybody who delivers it needs to say the instructions in the same way. Uh, it's very specific about when you start the timer and when you stop it. For example, in the word reading ones, you start, you press start when the child reads the first word and you press stop, obviously, when your one minute's up. Uh, if you were to press start when you say begin, they might lose two seconds. And because it's only one minute, every second counts. Uh, whereas with the maze assessment, you push start when you say begin and it's the same for everybody. They then turn the page and start. So. You, you must really follow all of those specific steps. It's really detailed and very clear in the teacher manual. Uh, anyone's allowed to administer it. It's not restricted to only qualified people. So you can train up um, your, your awesome learning assistants, your teachers, your school leaders, get the principal in there doing the assessments for you. They've got heaps of spare time. Uh, so you can absolutely read the manual, uh, watch some free online videos uh, if you need them and just get started. You don't, you're not required to do any training to deliver it. Um, the manual is so practical and detailed. I would recommend that you build at least one sort of Dibbles expert in your school if you're going to go school wide. So send them on a more in-depth professional development course. Um, Dibbles on the website have got... Um, through Amplify, who hosts some of the Dibbles um, management systems. For $49 American, they've got a, an online course of how to administer the testing and how to score it. Uh, 50 American dollars for 12 months access to that. So that's sort of a very basic one. Uh, but 
Spell South Australia have got two in-depth courses. I'll uh, just show you what they've got. So they have Australian 550 each, and each one's two days. So there's the administration and scoring one, and there's interpreting the data and planning for instruction as another two days. Uh, and I've only heard really excellent um, feedback from those two courses. So I, as I said, it'd be nice to build an in-school, in-house expert within your own setting. Okay, the other, another consideration is how you're going to, what you're going to do with all that data so that you can use it. So your options are uh, the spreadsheet I showed you, which is free, and you'll have links to download that from your materials I've given you. Uh, you can also look at doing, using, so some paid options. So hosted by Amplify, the company, there's the Dibbles data system, which is American $1 per student per year. They have a $200 American once-off setup fee. Um, this gives you the ability to pull all sorts of um, reports. So I really recommend getting started with the free version, but I think many people will want to go to a, a paid option where they can actually use a whole lot of features. So for example, um, you know, disaggregating your data by gender or by ethnicity to have a look at um, any disparity amongst your learners, um, the ability to look at one student's um, historical information and see their progress between years, uh, to look at whole classes or a whole school and see a proportion of children in different um, bands of risk and see that change over time, hopefully. So we're going to see that big red section really reduce over time and see lots more greens and blues. Uh, the spreadsheet doesn't do all of that for you. That's really beyond my spreadsheet skills. And then M class is a really fancy gold standard system, which is much more per student per year, but it's all administered digitally on a tablet and you are scoring it as you go and it automatically scores for you, spits the data into the management system, and then the graphs and the reports are really pretty. And then it also is linked to giving you instructional suggestions. So those are some options to look at. Another consideration is the most important one is that we're only doing dibbles to help us make teaching decisions. Uh, there is no reason doing an assessment and gathering data if we're not going to use it to inform our teaching and make better outcomes for our learners. Uh, so that's a whole other next step of um, learning once you've delivered the assessment, once you've tried out the assessment, gathered your information, then turn your attention in that direction. And then finally, uh, for you to think about as a, as a team or as a school, who's going to do the testing? So how can you best use your personnel and your time? Um, are you going to have one person test everybody? I always think it's much more valuable if teachers test their own students so they can really, uh, they can hear their responses and see how they go and they get a lot more value from that. Uh, but you might, it might just work better if one person does all of the assessments for you and gives the data back. When is that going to be done? You know, are you going to do everybody uh, I've heard of some schools setting up a testing room and they send through one class at a time and they get them all done in a week or is you're going to do it in your release time and where have you got a space that is you know your typical testing considerations it's no distractions uh, you know a quiet space comfortable space for children to do their assessments okay right so dibbles can tell us some things and it cannot tell us some other things so let's have a look it's going to identify who is at risk for reading failure. Really, really important so we can get that extra support in place. Um, it tells us what, what do we need to dig deeper into with our classroom diagnostic assessments and is our teaching resulting in learning through using the progress monitoring, which I haven't talked about yet. It does not tell us exactly what our students know, although even in the non-word fluency, you, you get some very useful information. Uh, but you still want to go and do a, a more in-depth assessment to give you what gaps do they have, what, what do they already know, we don't need to reteach that. Um, it doesn't align with the New Zealand curriculum, so that's not going to help us um, make judgments about where children are sitting within our learning progressions in our curriculum. Uh, just a heads up, if you don't know, the new English curriculum final version is now out. So it's really about making sure nobody falls through the gaps by checking on that progress and identifying risk, planning our teaching. And this is the exciting part, monitoring the effect of our teaching. Is our teaching working to 
uh, progress learning for our kids. I'm going to talk a little bit about progress monitoring now. Just let me stop and check for questions. Oh, thank you for answering some questions to each other. It's working at both the level. Okay, if a child is working above their year level, whoopee, hurrah, let's get stuck in and work with some really great texts with them and teach them lots of new vocabulary and use their reading to learn. Uh, we don't need to do anything special apart from uh, teaching them and in, in doing what the whole, the whole purpose of why we're teaching them to read is so that they can read and enjoy reading and learn from their reading. Uh, which is twice a year. Ewan's asked, we test twice a year, term two and term four. This test has beginning, uh, middle and end of year. Uh, what's the point of testing end and beginning as you're measuring change over the summer break? So what I recommend um, is that we do this testing four months apart. So if we do February, June and October, the next test in February is going to again be four months later. Uh, so I think that gives a nice even progress over time and also that uh, end of June test and the uh, October test enables you to use that information for uh, planning. You still got some teaching time left and also for uh, informing your overall teacher judgments for reporting. This is not to be used for reporting, but it can help you with your, um, your teacher judgment. All right, let me look at progress monitoring. So Dibbles provides these three times yearly benchmarks, but also for every year level, there are 20 forms that you can use for progress monitoring. That again, I'll just say again, all of the forms for one year level are the same level of difficulty. Our ex expectation for minimum score for benchmark increases over the year. So what's the difference? We do benchmark three times a year, beginning, middle and end. You can use a progress monitoring form as often as fortnightly. And they recommend about every two to four weeks, not for everybody. Uh, what do we use? So benchmark is all the subtests for a given benchmark, which takes five to seven minutes. And progress monitoring, we pick one subtest. I'll give you an example in a moment. So that's only going to take you two minutes maximum per student. Who's it for? Benchmark is every student on their year level. Uh, progress monitoring is just for the students who are at risk in yellow and red. And who are actually receiving some targeted teaching. Do not do progress monitoring if you are not giving intervention. You're not going to see any change from just giving these kids our core classroom teaching. So you're wasting your time and theirs doing progress monitoring in between if you're not doing something special that you're aiming to change and you want to track whether it's working. The benchmarks are compared to the age or year level expectations and criterion. And the progress monitoring is compared to the student's own scores over time. So we're looking for growth within that individual child, wherever they start from. Um, benchmark, we always use their grade level test. So a year five student gets the year five benchmark, no exceptions. Otherwise it's not valid data. We can't uh, check. We, we're always aiming to get kids up to where we'd like them to be for that year of schooling. Uh, so we want to use that measure to give us the right information. But progress monitoring, we can absolutely use off grade. So for example, you've got a year seven student who uh, really low oral reading fluency and low accurate accuracy. We are working on really building up their alphabetic code knowledge and their word reading skills. I would then use the nonsense word fluency. So the highest one of those is the year four. I would use that progress monitoring and it's going to give me a really nice picture of how their letter sound knowledge and word reading is growing over time. Uh, there's, there's quite clear guidance as to which progress monitoring tool to pick, which I won't go into today, but there is always one, one useful one. Um, the benchmark identifies risk and the progress monitoring identifies whether the children are growing, whether they're on track to catch up to that benchmark that we want them to get to. Benchmark tells us, is our teaching working for our students as a whole? And our progress monitoring says, is our teaching working for this student? Is their progress monitoring showing a flat line? It's not changing over time, or are we seeing it really aiming to hit that end of year benchmark? 
And both of them tell us what do we need now to target and to change in our teaching to make sure we're getting our children towards our goals. I will say just there, lots of the um, information I'm learning for my own professional learning that I'm watching says if our core classroom teaching is doing the job, if we've got really well evidence aligned structural literacy teaching, um, we should see that 80% of our children in every class are in that green zone. So if our core classroom teaching isn't hitting that, and be prepared, you, you're going to see a lot of red and yellow. I certainly have um, in the schools that have had a go um, with us. It's been a really good exercise to create some urgency um, for all of us to really, you know, try new things and make a shift towards more evidence-based teaching right now, because we can see that our kids are, are really in um, dire need of that help. Uh, so, yeah, if our core classroom teaching is not getting to 80% green, that's first where we need to change is our whole class teaching. So I'll show you what that, um, in the last couple of minutes, just a little bit more about progress monitoring. So what you do is you record that on a, just a, a chart, piece of paper. There are some spreadsheets available. I haven't found my favorite yet. So this would be, this one's looking at oral reading fluency, so passage reading. And we've got here February, March, April, May, so across the year. And we can see here at the beginning of the year, the beginning of your benchmark, the target for this, um, so the second grade that's out New Zealand year three, is 46 words per minute. And this student's got 15 here in February. And then progress monitoring every two weeks, uh, obviously doing some reading practice. And we're getting these scores being placed on there. So the end of your target for year three is 94 words per minute. So what you do on the student's graph is you put in place an aim line. And then when you're putting in place the progress monitoring information, you can see whether they are on track to then meet that target, which the student happily really is. That's awesome. But if we're seeing that progress monitoring down here, or it's going on an angle like this, it's improving but not fast enough, then that tells us we need to immediately change, uh, you know, increase the amount of practice opportunities or change how we're doing something so we're meeting their need. And if I put um, Millen's data onto a graph like that, we can see the same sort of thing. So here is his, um, the green crosses, I'm sorry, are the beginning, middle and end of year goal. And I've just joined up the beginning and end of year green minimum benchmark. His beginning of year uh, benchmark was 34 words correct per minute. And I just out of interest on the weekend did the next progress monitoring on him. And we were, this is aim line to the end of the year. And he was on 51 words correct per minute. So actually not quite, he's improved, but not quite enough to hit that end of year target. So obviously we're going to be doing some more homework. <laughs> right. Lots of powerful use for that uh, progress monitoring. Now, Dibbles, is, this is really important I get to in, in today's um, session, is that this is not normed on our New Zealand tamariki. Obviously, this is an American uh, group of children. Uh, this shows us the sample size of what the normative data was based on. So we see, you know, hundreds and a few thousands of children that have done these tests to give uh, that range of normal to give us those benchmark cut scores. Um, however, this is my opinion, and I, this is not researched in New Zealand that I'm aware of. So in the absence of New Zealand norms, if we were to use Dibbles consistently throughout a school, it would really help us to build a really detailed picture of specific teaching and learning needs across our school. Um, it's going to sensitively identify learners who are at risk of reading failure. It's a very well established um, tool. And it's going to help us um, really clearly detect rates of progress over very short time frames. So in between those three benchmarks, we can see from week to week that growth that we really want to see. And that helps us to really easily see the impact of our teaching. So I've got, um, I just wanted to share as well, I said before, if we're not going to use the data to inform our teaching, we shouldn't be using it. And I loved this golden rule of assessment. The best designed assessment with the most reliable and valid measures administered by the best trained assessor won't change a child's reading trajectory unless someone in the child's life does something different. And that's Natalie Rathbun. I heard that from Margie Gillis, who is amazing. She's literacy how. 
Let's have a look at how one of my schools have used this data this year. So they've done their Dibbles assessment for the first time. And we were able to put it in, put it to work straight away. And uh, we had some really fantastic results with it. So let me show you. This is data from a year, a composite year six, seven, eight class. And there were three classes at this school who did the same, um, went through the same process. This is one of the classes I've taken out all the student names. So we can see year six, seven, and eight. And this data you're looking at here is I've put into another spreadsheet. It's just their oral reading fluency results. So their words correct per minute. So here we go. And you can see uh, we've got plenty of yellow and red. And the benchmark for beginning of year for year six is 102 words correct per minute for year seven is 123 words per minute and for year eight 126 words correct per minute and that's the beginning of year benchmark so that was done in March we were a little bit late doing our beginning of year because we were just learning how to do the assessment so if I sort that data by words correct per minute we can see those class patterns a bit more clearly what we've done there is then identified the median score so the median is the middle child in the class which is going to be student 18 right here the middle one is 109 words correct per minute now dr matthew burns who is a fantastic researcher to listen to and learn from i've learned loads from him about doing uh, identifying class-wide needs and, and putting in place interventions using our data. So we can see here that our median 109 is below the benchmark for the beginning of the year. So yep, slightly higher than the year six one, but as a class 109 is lower than where we need them to be. So that means if our median is below the lowest number for the green benchmark we have got a class-wide need and that means the need of the class is not able to be addressed through purely through small group work so we needed a class-wide teaching intervention you know i said earlier that we need to go and do our more in-depth assessments once we've identified the children who are at risk so we we say we don't do those in-depth um di classroom di diagnostics on the whole class we want to do we want to say that time intensive assessment for just the kids who need it so doing these fast assessments enables us to give more time save time and give the time where it's needed uh, we couldn't go assessing all of those yellow and red students with our in-depth uh, phonics knowledge assessments uh, because there's just too many of them so we needed to do something else so from matthew burns uh, i learned a whole lot of information about an intervention called partner reading and paragraph shrinking that comes from a, a really well researched set of strategies called peer assisted learning strategies they've been around for decades and we put it into place across these three classrooms uh, it involved getting putting the students into pairs i'll show you how we did it and every day they read together and we chose to make it a knowledge building exercise. So instead of just picking um, a conglomeration of different uh, things for them to read, so it wasn't just recycling one day in Kiwi the next day and a story the next, we chose to do it about their inquiry topic. And um, so we pulled the reading materials from readworks.org, which is a, an incredible free resource full of reading material. We filtered it by topic and so the topic that we chose was weather and we picked reading material that was at the level of the second reader which i'll explain in a second so everything was to do with the weather for this couple of weeks we did the intervention so what we did we took that class data that i showed you just before and we split the class in half so we cut them here and kind of like a tennis draw we put the second half of the class paired them up with the first half of the class there like that. So that one at the top there, student nine, who was our um, most able reader, we saved student nine to be our floating reader. And we, so that meant when any other student was away, they could partner up with anybody else and be reader one. So we called our intervention Panui Tahi, which meant reading together. And we have reader one, which is our stronger reader, partnered with reader two. So for example, student 15 and student five were together and student 21 and student 12. And this is how it works. 
So for 10 days uh, and for 20 minutes a day, we replaced small group guided reading with this partner reading and paragraph shrinking intervention. And this is how it works. So this slide comes from a, a webinar, which I've got the link for just here that, that shows you how to do it. And so what they do for one minute, uh, they go and one reader one goes and picks up their folder of reading material, reader two goes and finds a place to work. And then the timer starts. So, so reader one, our stronger reader, reads the text for five minutes. And reader two follows along um, exactly where reader one's reading. And if reader one stumbles on any words, reader two will help them and you teach them how to prompt each other. Then the timer goes and for the second five minutes, reader two goes back to the start, they reread what reader one just read them. So they've just had it modeled and reader one will prompt reader two with any words they might stumble on. Okay, so that's the first section. The second half is the paragraph shrinking part. So we go back to reader one, they carry on from where reader two left off. They read for five minutes, but this time after every paragraph, they pause and they shrink the paragraph. So they say the most important who or what the paragraph is about. So in our example, it's the weather and the scientists and the most important thing about the who or what, and it might be that uh, weather is becoming more extreme, there's droughts and fires and floods. And then in 10 words on their fingers, 10 words or less, they have to shrink it and give a summary. So they might say, scientists say weather is changing because of humans. Good, eight words, and they keep reading. And then the last part is, reader two then they don't go back and reread what part of what reader one did that this time they carry on and they pause every paragraph and do their paragraph shrinking so we're getting some really nice um repeated reading practice listening to text modeled sorry not repeated reading echo reading uh just wide reading practice lots of eyes on print and lots of minutes of practice reading in fact lots more minutes than they would be getting if we were doing guided reading with them in small groups and they were taking turns or um, just reading independently and so it's accountable there's a purpose they're sharing with each other and they're learning together and the paragraph shrinking is really building their comprehension skills they have to use that synthesizing information and summarizing so it was it was a really neat routine and then they go and put their work away and that's your 20 minutes it's very structured you've got to teach them a routine so when I say 10 days they spent two days of week one this term sort of learning that routine and then from Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday, we did the intervention. And I'm thrilled to tell you that our results just mirrored exactly what the researchers showed me in the webinars we were watching. So here is our class data beforehand, which you've already seen. So we've got this spread of um, zero to 138 words correct per minute and the accuracy uh, again spread from zero to 100% correct. Uh, or looking at that, if we don't count that zero, 87% to 100% words correct. So after the intervention, the two weeks, we now have our class median has jumped from 109 words correct per minute up to 128 words correct per minute in just two weeks, which is stunning. And the, the spread of data has shrunk, shrunk as well. So now from 54 to 103 words correct and our accuracy Although the median didn't change very much, we now we've shifted so that there's a, a smaller range of uh, accuracy in their reading. And you can see this column here, anything that's green shows growth for individual students. So I'm um, not sure what, what went on here with this particular one we went down, just might be that passage or that day. But uh, we've got you know things like a jump in 12 words correct per minute, 33 words correct per minute, 38, 10, 11, everybody almost made some really beautiful improvements. And a really cool thing was we were also learned that we should expect that this would benefit even our strong readers. And we absolutely saw that in that our strongest reader went from 138 to 150 words correct per minute, uh, 131 to 137. This one stayed similar, but there were lots of jumps uh, in amongst the classrooms where our strong readers really benefited as well. So here's that data presented as a graph. You can see those nice shifts in their words correct per minute. And th these are arranged from our strongest reader down to our um, slowest, most effortful readers at, on the right hand side. And also, if we look at back at our compared to the 
benchmark cut scores of those categories of um, aspiration, you know, blue, blue, green, yellow and red, we had 14 of our students who were yellow and red, who were going to need more in depth diagnostic assessments, and only seven were green and we had no blue. And after the intervention, after two weeks, we had shrunk that down to eight students needing more in depth assessment. We had a whole lot more in green and we even had three up in the blue, that aspirational goal. So we were absolutely thrilled um, big celebrations. And what I really noticed from this process was the sense of teacher efficacy. So that clear, we had cold hard data showing that it was precisely their work, their mahi of learning how to do the intervention and running it with their class. Uh, that made the difference. These, these kids are year six to eight students. So it's not like it was just time that made the difference. It was absolutely what the teachers put in place. Um, and so they're hooked on, on this data and what it can do for them and how it can help them um, really support their students. And it was just a really, a really wonderful day when we put all that data together and, and saw the impact. The second thing was the students to see their own growth Again, they were absolutely thrilled uh, as a class and individually, and we will carry on with progress monitoring, but most importantly, with frequent oral reading out loud in different ways. We're going to use a, a variety of strategies. We're going to be doing uh, Reader's Theatre some weeks or a Poetry Slam some weeks, the partner reading paragraph shrinking, and also we're going to be doing the ReadWorks article a day, uh, building each student's book of knowledge but we will make it a partner activity where they read aloud to each other instead of just silent reading so we've shrunk down uh, another celebration we now have instead of 14 in that specific class only eight more in-depth assessments to do to really look at what gaps we need to uh, fill for those learners although we are still going to be doing a whole class spelling assessment because that is uh, although we've impacted on their reading their spelling is obviously a whole nother kettle of fish and it's much more complex to uh, for the students to do so that's another area we're going to be looking at okay so when you're going to get started uh my granddad always says so i've got a quote from emma's granddad when all else fails read the instructions <laughs> so i wanted to say read the manual first particularly chapter two which tells you how to give the test to the students exactly what to say when to start your timer how to record responses how to score it what adaptations and accommodations are allowed all of that sort of thing so you've got all of that in this manual so i recommend you i've got mine printed out spiral bound just just get that and you you might want to do the whole thing or just maybe that chapter two part where you're um gives you the instructions on how to do each test and how to mark them. Um, to reduce testing errors, and I mean, so people use the right forms, uh, I just recommend that you clearly label and use the right form. So you saw on my forms, I've, I've added the New Zealand year level to the, to the corner of the form. So it's really clear to everybody when they pick it up, which form they're using. Um, I used the watermark option in um, preview on my map to do that. Um, so I printed it with a watermark to another PDF file. Uh, and I also relay, renamed all of the files. I downloaded everything that I needed and I renamed them so that I've now got New Zealand year three in the file because it says the American grade. So in the materials I've shared with you, I've also got this, um, I made a sort of a one, two page explainer about what each subtext is. It's got a picture of what it looks like and it describes um, a really brief description of what it is and how you do it. So you could use that to help your staff learn about it. Um, I've also made a sort of a two page getting started guide of just the, the basics of what you need to think about and what you can do to help you get going. Because it certainly feels like a sea of documents when you download it. Uh, you can go, there's a link on the handouts I've sent you to get to the website where you can get those uh, the spreadsheet for the data management. I really recommend you use it in Excel and not in Google Sheets. And I say that because Excel is much easier to protect the spreadsheets and stop um, 
you know, the formula is getting broken. It mu looks much nicer to use, it's just, but the Google Sheets is there as well if you, like, if you need to use that one. Uh, on my website, I've also made a document of just some other free webinars and things that I found really helpful when I was learning. So there's a document you can download there with links to other videos online. You could use in staff meetings to learn or this webinar. Okay, there are two Facebook groups I want to point you to. So there's Dibbles in Oz, uh, which has got lots and lots of members and it's, it's really active and you can ask any questions and somebody there will help you. But also, ta-da, I've just made us a lovely Dibbles in New Zealand group. So you can hop in there and that's a really good place to ask any questions you've got from now on, which you're welcome to join. And as you learn, uh, please help me out with answering other people's questions as they uh, want to learn as well. So may I ask you before we wrap up, uh, could you please pop in the chat one, an aha moment or something that you found really interesting from today? And number two, just a goal for yourself or a next step of what you might like to do next in terms of getting started with dibbles what do you need to learn more about or are you just going to get stuck in and have it a go um, love it if you would share that in the chat just now <laughs> next step read the manual yeah all right carry on in there i'm going to um just wish everybody good evening and and um and goodbye but I will stay on uh, if there are people who want to stay and ask questions right now that's no problem so thank you so much for giving up your afternoon to learn some more about this assessment I hope that's made it uh, less overwhelming and scary to just have a go and get started really recommend you just just try it out with one child see how easy it is it's definitely not rocket science it's a very very simple uh, set of tools to use and it just gives you so much uh, rich and valuable and useful information about about our learners to help plan our teaching. Uh, so uh, ngā mihi nui, thank you very much for joining us and you have a lovely evening. Okay, hei kona.